Welcome to Belmont Poetry Night. I'm Monica Corday, your host and the Poet Laureate of Belmont, California. We meet on the third Tuesdays of every month to celebrate the spoken word as makers, listeners, and admirers of poetry. We come with featured guests sometimes and an open mic always. Although we may still not be at our favorite physical venue, the Belmont Library, since the pandemic, our thriving poetry circle has transitioned to this virtual space, and I am grateful this allows me to welcome poets and listeners from across the globe. Uh, it would be great to know where you are joining me from. So as always, please share in the chat. Uh, and thanks for joining me and, and Zooming in. Uh, as we roll from one month into another, and I curate these poetry nights uh, in honor of the maker and their craft. Uh, I also bring them to you with an intention to create uh, a sort of breathing space where one can experience moments of spaciousness by entering poems and conversations that can act as a guide to center our, our thoughts. Um, as the season has shifted to longer, warmer days, I thought of putting this evening together in the theme of summer days and poetry nights, uh, because poetry carries us through all seasons, doesn't it? And in winter, we may seek poems holding light and warmth. Um, in summer and autumn, we may look for poems about renewal and transitions, but summer uh, pulls us towards this bright shining joy pouring through an open window, a relaxing escape to explore the outdoors and we often find ourselves uh, dazed by memories of summers gone by. Uh, whatever feelings summer, summer evokes for you, I'd say there's no doubt there's a poem out there to capture it. And uh, one such poem I'd like to open with tonight uh, is a hyben, which is written by poet Amy Nezikumatathil. And the poem is called Summer Hyben. To everything, there is a season of parrots. Instead of feathers, we searched the sky for meteors on our last night. Salamanders use the stars to find their way home. Who knew they could see that far, fix the tiny beads of their eyes on distant arrangements of lights so, so as to return to wet and wild nests. Our heads tilt up and up, and we are careful never to look at each other. You were born on a day of peaches splitting from so much rain, and the slick smell of fresh tar and asphalt pushed over a cracked parking lot. You were strong, even as a baby, to clutch a fistful of thistle, and the sun himself was proud to light up your teeth when they first swelled and pushed up from your gums. And this is how I will always remember you when we are covered up again by the pale mica flecks on your shoulders, some thrown there from your own smile, some from my own teeth. There are not enough jam jars to can this summer sky at night. I want to spread those little meteors on a hunk of still warm bread this winter. Any trace left on the knife will make a kitchen sink like that evening air. The cool night before star showers so sticky, so warm, so full of light. Thank you. Well, wasn't that a, a luminous piece? Uh, I, I was really enchanted by it while reading it. And, and uh, Amy Nezikumatathil, the poet, uh, she's known for writing poems that sit at the intersection of, of three cultures, Filipino, Indian, and American. And her poems are always rich with imagery. 
Um, and the form that she uses, uh, she says about it, uh, that a way to capture a slice of travel in a poem can be found in a hyben. Uh, the hyben, as many of you know, is a Japanese poetic form, a slice of a journey or destination uh, composed of a prose poem. And it ends in a whisper of sorts with a haiku. And the haiku at the end you heard was the cool night before star showers, so sticky, so warm, so full of light. And uh, talking about poems that make you travel, uh, we have a poet amongst us tonight who has the superpower to transport you to any part of his world just by the flick of his pen. And I am so honored to have him as my featured poet for this evening. Uh, you all know whom I'm talking about. It is Joe Cottonwood, and he doesn't need an introduction, but here goes. Joe has balanced his life as a home improvement contractor by day, author by night. He's from Maryland, imprinted Appalachian, educated mis Midwestern, settled half a century under redwoods in the coastal mountains of California. Joe is widely published and translated around the world from Italy to Pakistan to Peru. His latest book of poetry is Random Saints. Previous poetry books include Foggy Dog, Poems of the Pacific Coast. He is the author of many popular novels for adults and children and the award-winning memoir, 99 Jobs, Blood, Sweat and Houses. He lives in La Honda, California. Welcome, Joe. It's great to have you tonight. Thank you, Monica. <clears throat> um, wow, it's lovely to be here. <clears throat> I've often tried to attend back in the day when Belmont met in person. I kept trying to attend, but I always had a conflict and only made it once or twice. In fact, once, and, and that was, it turned out to be student poetry night Instead oh. of hearing the regular group, I heard students, high school students reading their poetry, which was wonderful. So anyway, I'm glad to join the group now by Zoom. I see. Really and glad, I'm, yeah, that, that the virtual world makes it so easy. I'm delighted that there's a truly a worldwide audience here. <laughs> um, so do you want me to start with a poem or... Yeah, yeah. Before we head into a conversation, I thought maybe we could start with you reading a poem or two, taking us through some some summer shenanigans and stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, slightly intimidated by that poem you read, which set a very high tone. <laughs> um, but I, I just recently rediscovered this poem that I wrote several years ago. And it's very summer. And I, I never read it to a group. I don't know why. So here goes. It's called Upward Through Bubbles. Upward Through Bubbles, in swimsuits, nervous. They are essentially naked. The girls gather at the bridge, gasping, giggling, budding bodies bouncing as they climb over the steel rail, stand at the outside edge, hold hands, scream, and jump. The scary plunge to cool water. Donner Creek, where toe touching the sandy bottom, they burst upward through bubbles to sunlight, to air, whipping hair with laughter, relief, stronger now, sweet courage with a touch of spice. Frog kicking to shore, they smile at the baggy legged boys who dared them, standing hands in pockets smaller now, feigning indifference, unworthy of their loveliness. That was a perfect poem to start with, uh, Joe, for uh, all the summer season and, uh, and, and the swimming lessons or just going for a swim. It was fantastic. <laughs> I was, I considered myself very lucky to witness that event and just had to write it down. Um, would, would you like to uh, go uh, take a question before you uh, go to the next one or just go for the for the next poem as well? 
let me go to the next one and then I'll, then I'll be ready to Absolutely. Talk. Yeah, I think that that's a great idea. Okay. Um, this one, I, I only wrote the poem recently, but it's an about event that happened 35 years ago, but it could just as well happen today. It's called The Stranger in the Car Behind. A mighty gust of fog rips three bicycles from the rope and bungee web atop my van to fly past the rear window as my gut drops in a center lane on the Golden Gate Bridge. So I stop. God help me. I stop. Jump out. Run back to where the stranger in the car behind, blessedly not a tailgater, braked in time, now has put on his blinkers and hustled forward as together under steel cables while wet wind howls with diesel smoke as cars roar by on both sides while an oil tanker glides beneath. He says not one word in the quick desperation, helps gather three bent bicycles from the roadway, which I stuff on top of three scared children as a stranger to whom I have said not one word, not a thank you, not a moment for it, runs back to his car in the mad din of about 30 seconds while I hop into the driver's seat and stomp on the gas and gone. And the stranger, whoever, never asked to be a hero, pumped adrenaline, scrambled amid traffic where no trucks or buses plowed into us, survived and drove on and gone. So to you, right here, right now, reading this poem, yes, you, to all you strangers in all the cars behind, let me say in advance, thank you. Bless you for what without hesitation you will do. Thank you so much. Wow, that was something. What, what an experience to have, really <laughs> thrilling. That was a thrilling ride, I would say. <laughs> it's funny, you know, there was no thought in my head going on at, at the time it was happening. It only hit me later. Wow, I, 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 can, I can visualize this poem being, being by a traffic, traffic light post. That would be really cool. People walking by can, can read something, something like that and just be thankful for, for the cars who take care. <laughs> you were saying something, Joe? No, I was just wondering whether were there were any, um, any, any questions about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, not specifically about the poem, but uh, the 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 style of your writing, which is uh, which is narrative yet so poetic. And uh, I could call you a poet philosopher, and and also in tradition of narrative poets such as Tennyson, uh, Poe, or or Lewis Carroll, uh, your poems are are so engaging, uh, engaging stories. I'd say with with that uncanny ability to bring everyday encounters into conversations, and uh, we also see uh, how your poetry is fed with a gamut of experiences. Uh, in the in the next few poems, also uh, we hear, I'm sure it'll all come up. Uh, you as a writer, as a father, as a professional woodworker, and even as a townsman. And one of the things I'm interested in knowing is the role of the poet in relation to the experiences that they carry, and also what led you to poetry? Those are two distinct questions. Um, I, I'm i gonna kind of dodge the role of the poet. I'm not sure what that is. Um, and the reason I'm not sure is that I don't, I'm not trying to fill a role. I'm, the reason I write poetry is I can't stop. It's as simple as that. Um, I've written it all my life, and I've, I'm a storyteller. I'm not, I'm not a lyric poet. I'm a, I'm a narrative poet, as you said. Um, hopefully, there's some good writing in there, but um, I'm, no, I'm not Alfred Lord Tennyson by any means. Um, uh, but I, 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 I started writing poetry in high school, and I never stopped, but I never published it. I got a couple out, but um, I concentrated on writing fiction, writing novels, really, because I was trying to make some money, honestly. 
and I love writing novels too. It's not like it was a second, second best. Um, but I knew, you know, I could get them published and I did. And then I, I never had any confidence that my poetry was any good. And I never even tested it until a long time later. Um, but I never could stop. And finally, I just gave myself into it and said, I, <laughs> this is it. I'm From here on out, I'm just going to do poetry. And maybe someday I'll go back to fiction or some other kind of writing. But and, and you know that book you mentioned of mine, 99 Jobs, that's nonfiction. But so many people read it, very short chapters. And, and so many people said to me, you know, these are really like poems, these little chapters. And I thought, okay, I'm writing poetry even when <laughs> writing prose. So I think I'll just go to poetry. And I, I, for the last 10 years, it's been pure poetry and I've just loved it. That's that's really amazing, Joe. And uh, do you still go back to fiction at all, just to scribble scribble things down, or or make notes, or or something, or is it purely poetry that you work on? I make notes. I keep a journal. I've kept a journal since since high school, mm. and sometimes I go back there and find things that I really should have explored more, and then I do now. And right. That's where that poem I just read came from. I was reading a journal from oh 1987. And there was that event on the bridge, and I thought I, I I never wrote about that. I should do that. True, I think I think by by the other question, uh, which uh, which was about the role of the poet in relation to experiences that they carry, I I had this uh, thought that uh, it's not exactly to keep an account of things or the experiences or the incidents that you share in your poem uh, poems. Uh, it's not. Uh, to keep a, a journal entry kind of a, a diary kind of a thing for those. But at the same time, I feel that writing about them and reflecting back on experiences, like you said, the poem you wrote was recent, but the incident happened like way before. So uh, I think as a reader, when we come into a poem like that, it just takes us into that moment that you have lived and then we experience it through your eyes. So I guess that uh, that that is probably what what may be the role of poet here where you are taking us back in time in in a time of your own making and and of your own experience to to let us let us in and and have that peek peek into what what happened I, I can tell you the role of that poem in my life was when I started writing and I didn't know how it was going to end I mean I was just trying to get to what happened but once you start with a true event, the poem takes on a life of its own and starts to write itself. And I'm sure everybody listening knows that feeling. Um, so you start with the truth and the poem, when you start writing it, you see there's a, actually a bigger truth and you start following that until you get to the end. And by the time I got to the end of that poem, I knew I had to thank that driver. I didn't begin knowing I was going to do that. Um, so the role of poetry to me is sort of the enlighten myself and hopefully others as well. So true, absolutely, Joe. That makes uh, makes so much sense. Uh, well, well, thank you so much. If we can he hear more poems, that'll be great. And then we can move on to the other questions. Okay, here's a short one. Uh, it's again, still a summer poem, uh, a beach poem. It's called Chatterbox. Chatterbox, she to whom talking is like breathing, at age three, a mockingbird of words, wades uh. in foam on a Pacific beach. A sleeper wave slams her little body face down, floating. I grab hair like seaweed, pull her up, coughing, spitting. Later, wrapped in a towel, she is quiet thoughtful, when to my lurching heart, she says, if I drowned, would you have another baby? The silence I could not imagine. Thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I want to say that, that that poem has touched a lot of people. It's always the one before that, that I read about the, the bridge 
at the same time, it's brought up, it's triggered some really horrible memories for a couple of people. And I don't, I, I feel so bad about that. But I mean, there are people who have lost loved ones in traffic, you know, and, and I don't want to trigger that. And I, I heard from two people who had daughters that, that drowned. And they said, thank you for the poem. And it reminded me of <laughs> my daughter's drowning. And what do you say? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah. That's sort of the risk of, of creating art. You you don't know what where it's going to other people. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's really moving uh, the piece itself, and also I think it in some ways it is it has that cathartic experience for the reader, uh, especially those who have have gone through the tragic loss or the the experience of it. So yeah, thank you for writing that piece, Joe. Uh, love to hear one more uh, before we go on. Okay, here's a, um, here's a poem about a fish. And it's definitely a summer poem. Its title is Henrietta, A Summer Love. I do not claim to own this creek, but it flows through my property and perhaps I own each day's gurgle that wakes me and beds me alone after a winter of slow goodbye. Today, a new sound, splash and thrash. A salmon the size of an otter struggles upstream over gravel, pool to pool where she rests, gathers strength for the next leap and spurt, driven by a memory she does not remember. Nine miles from the Pacific, she stops at this dark pool under my footbridge. In a drought year, no farther. Henrietta, I christen thee after my favorite aunt who has your face. I do not claim to own this fish, but all summer she hovers in shadow, fins barely moving, facing upstream. Water enters, water departs, too shallow each way for escape. At the post office, I happen to meet Debbie, a biologist who knows salmon who also knows loss. Something compels me to bring her to my bridge, a secret in a town of anglers we tell no one else. Debbie says Henry is waiting for a lover. Next day and next, Debbie drops by. I'm not sure why. Together, daily, we watch. Henrietta says little, avoids eye contact. Same with Debbie, who says they often starve, waiting to spawn, they die. One morning, October, I wake to the rush of rain. I run to the bridge where Debbie is already waiting, her hand on my shoulder, mine, hers. Henrietta is gone. Debbie says Henry might return next spring. Please, she says, call me if and when. I'm still waiting. Strange, the signs we miss, the love, the fish. Wow, I think uh, uh, a very integral part of poetry is, is the way uh, the poet uh, weaves in silence in poems and both the poems that you just shared, uh, Joe, um, the chatterbox, what a haunting, haunting silence at the end of it. And even in Henrietta, uh, the last lines, uh, I'm still waiting, strange the signs we miss, the love, the fish. And it, it also plays with another kind of silence, uh, another kind of sadness, I'll say. And uh, in, in all of your poems that I have heard previously and, and now that we are hearing them, uh, we experience a sort of regrounding in your poetry as we gravitate towards uh, the beauty of shared humanity uh, your writing reflects. And you've often talked about how your best poetry happens when you are at play. Uh, my question is, when you are dealing with a grave subject in your poems, uh, how does playfulness as an approach exist in concert with sadness or heavy feelings when you're writing? 
That's so hard to answer, but <laughs> I, I, I know I told you I, I, I need to feel playful when I'm writing, um, and it, I, I think it's in improv. They say the your the yes yes and I think that's the essence of play, and um, you open your mind to ideas and and let them play um, without much of a filter. But you know, play, play is really serious. Um, ch children playing, that's how they learn. I mean, in the good schools, they let, <laughs> they learn through playing. And certainly at home, they're working out all the life's problems in their play. Um, so maybe I'm just being a child again, playing. Um, the, the, I guess playing means don't take yourself too seriously. That's what it means to me when I'm writing. Um, there's a time after I've written to go back and edit and fix stupid things that I said. And I do say a lot of stupid things, um, but that, that's what I mean. Does that it make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when you when you put it uh, that way, it, it does make a lot of sense. And and it, it it's more for the writer himself uh, where, where you're telling yourself not to take it too seriously but at the same time you are reflecting on on some serious uh issues or 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 incidents that that you have uh so i think in in turn uh even if it is a serious topic you are dealing with i feel that uh your approach to them is is very interesting which allows you to in in some ways probably dissociate from that uh, from that that memory, if if it is a harsh memory. Well, I you know that poem I just read about Henrietta the fish. That's pretty playful in my mind because yeah, it's not. It, it's based on a the starting fact is my my good friend Terry Adams had had that Henrietta living under his bridge. So in the in the poem, I take Terry's persona and and I'm speaking as him. Um, and and then I just played with it, um, and the ending I guess is kind of serious. I did you know, but I didn't know I was going there when I started. Uh, True, but that was playful. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It is one of my favorite poems uh, from you, Joe. So thanks for sharing that. And and yeah, please, uh, if you'd like to share another piece. Uh... Okay, here's one that starts out playful and suddenly doesn't go there. Um, and I'll tell you in advance, I had a hard time getting this one published for a while. And then something changed in the culture and suddenly it was snapped up. And you'll know what changed when you, uh, when you get to the end. It's called a working graveyard shift. And point of fact, I used to, before I became a carpenter, I, I, I worked a graveyard shift for three years in a computer environment. Working graveyard shift, my sleep is nuts. So on nights off, I walk the dog at 3 a.m. hoping a German shepherd normalizes me, except Quinn growls at the cop who stays in his cruiser, talking through the open window, just letting me know that somebody called from one of those dark houses, but there's no law against walking at 3 a.m. So have a good night. Sometimes I jog the golf course under quiet stars. I let Quinn off the leash. Together we run over grass. Even without a canine nose, I love the smell, the sound of sleeping, snoring chlorophyll. One night I'm running when the sprinklers start. Immediately before I can think better, I pull off my clothes, every stitch. I run. So free, it's fantastic. The dog agrees until I trip and roll, but that's fantastic too, except the bruises and suddenly the spotlight, the cop. I have mud on my body, grass in my hair. The sprinklers keep chug, chug, chugging in circles, splat with cold bullets across my butt as the cop writes out a ticket 
for an unleashed dog? That's all, because there's no law against running through sprinklers on graveyard shift when you're white. Wow, that ending, Joe. Did did any of uh, any of the editors or did you hear back from anyone when when you said that it's it was hard to get this piece published? Did they write back with a reason? No, they just rejected it. <laughs> <laughs> and and do you uh, do you have a feeling why it it didn't work for for a while and then then it just caught on? George Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Black Lives Matter was just sort of gaining momentum and finally it just broke into the mainstream and that then it was ready. Yeah, that that's a remarkable piece you've written and and I like you said it starts off playful and and then suddenly it is not which is so true. Yeah, that's what I think just gets gets you when you start reading the poem you are following and then bang right there in the end it just it just gives you that that strong punch in your face. But uh, uh, with with all these poems also uh, I, you've shared today and, and since you regularly post your published poems on Facebook, uh, a while back I had read uh, another poem of yours called Omaha, USA, uh, where you talk about real America. And it had this uh, similar, uh, I'd call it unfettered style of writing that, that this poem uh, offers. Uh, it resonates with the beatniks who captured uh, a very authentic expression of the world they see, uh, poetically uh, experimental with, with a sense of freedom in their writing. And I was wondering if, if the beatniks had their poetry uh, and their poetry had an influence on your writing and who were uh, the other literary artists you drew from, drew from at the time? I was... Yeah, I grew up in high, I was in high school. I, I was reading beatnik poetry a lot. I loved Lawrence Ferlinghetti, especially. I'm not a fan of Allen Ginsberg, so shoot me. Um, Jack Kerouac, I mentioned in the poem. Um, I, was, I was just, on the road was my Bible, um, but I was high school. Um, and my older brother was a beatnik. He's about four years older than me. And then um, college came, the 60s, late 60s, uh, I guess it started mid 60s. Um, I just jumped into the hippie culture. I like that. <laughs> the peace and love appealed to me a lot more than the more, I don't know, cynical, hard bitten edge that a lot of beatnik poetry had. I mean, I still love the poetry and I, and I agree with what they say, but it wasn't for me, I don't know. I, I, I don't really qualify as a hippie or a beatnik. Um, but, um, you know, Richard, yeah, Browdigan yeah. Started, Richard Browdigan started to influence me more than uh, anyone else back then. He, he wrote some very clear, straightforward, no nonsense poems that, well, I, I shouldn't say no nonsense. There's a lot of nonsense in there, but <laughs> that's what appealed to me. Um, I don't know, a lot of I've also been uh, always influenced. Oh my gosh. Whenever anyone asks me who influenced me, my mind goes blank. Um, Langston Hughes, I'm sorry. I don't know why I have trouble with his name. I, I read him all the time. I, I just admired him and I admired William Carlos Williams. And one more hero, hero of mine, oddly enough, was Jose Marti. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I, I learned Spanish so as much as I, far as I got, simply so I could read his poetry. Um, so those are some of my influences. Yeah, that, that that's really great. And I think it, it comes through in your poems because they, that is why I think that they have this universal appeal because you connect to, to uh, readers across the globe. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is uh, I, I read this a while back and I had mentioned to you once that uh, the beatniks had this uh, philosophy of uh, first thought is the best thought. And uh, I remember you mentioned that is, that is not what you go by or, or is it? Have you ever done that? Sometimes the first thought is best, but usually <laughs> not. Um, usually the first thought is pretty good. <laughs> 
but no, it needs work. Um, very rarely does, do I, does it just come out right out? It does sometimes though. Um, Chatterbox, that was a, that was just boom. I wrote it. Uh, on the other hand, it had been stewing in my head for 40 years. So um, the first thought was, had a lot of uh, maturity to it. Um, others I have to work at. And I, I think at the end of the day, you can't tell which ones I worked on or which ones just came out. Um, I, I, there's a certain level of poem has to reach to before I'm satisfied with it. Right, right, yeah, that, that's true. I think all of us struggle with that and in some ways, uh, uh, all those who attempt at writing. And uh, yeah, if, if you have another poem uh, to share, we can, we can hear that first. Um, how about if I do, do just one more for now and come back at the end with one? Sure. Um, and I'll introduce this a bit. Um, a few years ago, I attended a wedding. It was a backyard wedding, a very simple affair. Um, it was small because the bride's parents and all of her family refused to attend. It seems the groom was the wrong color, the wrong religion. And so I knew the groom because he'd worked for me as a, in my construction for a while. And um, I didn't know his wife at all, but um, there she was. And they had nothing. They were just dirt poor, so in love, just starting out. And I looked into the eyes of that bride taking wedding vows and they shone so bright and, and I could see her family, the spirits of her family dancing there in her eyes and there's no way she could keep her family out of that wedding. So I wrote this, um, this poem it comes from that. It's called All of Your Ancestors Come to Your Wedding. By horse, by canoe, they come, dressed in grass skirts and beaver pelt hats. They bring amphorae of wine, barrels of ancient beer. They fight, belch, kiss both cheeks. They hug too tight, make ribald jokes. They embarrass you utterly. They paint flowers on your face and weave sunshine in your hair. They smoke sacred herbs, chant, pound on drums, sing in lost language. They puff music in hollowed bamboo, dance in circles, juggle flaming torches. They draw antelope on the walls of your cave. As dowry, they bring generations of struggle millenniums of sacrifice. They will come to your wedding, whether you invite them or not. Wish them welcome. That's a beautiful piece, Joe. Thank you so much for sharing that one. And also the story that you shared behind the writing of this piece, uh, that, that was, that really connected with me. Uh, and, um, in, in the way that you deliver your poems also, there is this really a uh, cool theatrics involved, I'd say, with, with the mo voice modulations you have, and you are such a versatile artist, uh, a poet and a master storyteller. And it, it comes from you being a fiction writer, as we know, and having written novels. And, and one of the days I came across this uh, podcast of uh, your children's novels, uh, the Adventures of Boone Barnaby. Uh, and I listened to a few chapters and uh, engaging and fun, I must say. But uh, uh, what I see is that you have a great understanding of making your work accessible to the world. Uh, not only are you widely published, but uh, you've also been very cool in trying out different mediums of publishing, uh, especially when it comes to putting your work online. Uh, how would you describe this journey of yours from writing to publication? And uh, do you have any advice for other poets on this journey? Try everything. <laughs> That's, I, uh, my first book was 
um, published by a small press in San Francisco, and it was an, an abominable mess. Um, my second book, though, was um, I was planning to self-publish, but um, my next door neighbor was an agent, and he read it and said, I can sell this, and sold it, and it, it became a bestseller, I mean, relatively all over the world. It was translated in all these languages. And I still get fan mail. I mean, this was published in 1978. And I still get an occasional email from someone who says, oh, that book changed my life. I just wanted to tell you. Um, but so I, that, that was a big New York publisher. Then I, had, then I started writing children's books. And I, my publisher was Scholastic, which is as big as they get in children's publishing. And then um, Harry Potter came along. And Scholastic lost interest in middle re, uh, mid list writer is what I'm called. That's a writer who's in the middle of the list, not a bestseller, um, not a complete failure. But Scholastic and all the publishers at the time decided we want blockbusters like Harry Potter. We don't want these mid list guys anymore. And I couldn't get published, so I started self publishing. And at the same time, I I just the podcasting was just starting up. And I jumped into it. I thought, this is great. I've always wanted to dramatize my books. And I got into that. And it's astonishing. I, uh, the Adventures of Boone Barnaby has been downloaded a million times. And <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I don't, they, you know, I don't get any money from it. Um, it's just invisible to me what's happening out there. Um, so then um, eBooks came along. I thought, OK, let's see what we can do with that. And I didn't find that very satisfying, really, but it was an adventure. And then I just did, I'm in poetry now. And, um, you know, the, the best environment for poetry is online. I mean, I, I have many things published in, in journals, print journals, but many more published in online journals, because I think poetry is a perfect medium for online. And uh, I think people now have such short attention spans, a poet, a good poem can can grab them in a way that you know a good short story they're not going to read it anymore so it really forces you to condense 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 and get your idea down and i've gotten pretty good at that i think but anyway i, I just uh, will try whatever needs trying and i don't know what's around the corner maybe i'll be on TikTok next or something i don't know <laughs> Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised, Joe, at all. And you are you are not just good at this. Come on, you you are fantastic, uh, brilliant. I'd say uh, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, do you do you have another piece to share now, or do we want to keep it for later? No, I think we should go to an open mic now. I'd like to hear some other people. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I'll I'll call upon you once again at the for for a closing poem in in that case. Uh, but uh, but it was. Uh, a joy listening to your poems and uh, this Thank summer you. evening feels just perfect like sitting on the patio and being treated to all sights and sounds of passers-by and all stories coming to life so um, very grateful Joe for the wisdom humor and slice of every day that you've shared through your reading tonight um, I'll open the floor up briefly for any comments or questions before we close this segment and I end the recording uh, while you share your words with Joe, I can share some links of his works and his website. So please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, I, this is not about poetry, but it's about the uh, Golden Gate Bridge poem. The, I think you'd be interested to know that early in Ralph Nader's career, there was a uh, Chevy that was very poorly engineered and was causing accidents. So anyway, uh, Ralph Nader was on the highway and there was a Corvair in trouble and he uh, helped. And he said after that, when there was an accident, there was, he would pull over, he would always stop. And then he wrote a book about unsafe at any speed about the court fair. <laughs> and that was the beginning of public citizen and the native raiders. So I thought you'd be interested in the historical note. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. If I may, I particularly appreciate the, the, the narrative poetic styling, how they, how you blend them. I mean, I've been working with a little bit of that myself. And so I can appreciate how you, you did that. And the living story, you know, I have a parallel story to the freeway story, but I won't go into that. I just wanted you know that I appreciate the narrative poetic balance and um, the immediacy. I mean, the way you read the poem also has its effect. Of course, you know all that, but I just wanted to say I appreciated both. And um, I like the immediacy of, of, of actually all the poems. There's a sense of that in them. The senses are front, if you know what I mean. Well, anyway, thank you. Thank you, you know, for that. I, I've been schooled by readings, open mics, and by Zoom. And I, I do have, I have other poems that I'm, I'm not going to read here because they're, they're page poems. They don't, they don't work out loud. But, but I'm, I always gravitate toward the ones that do work out loud. Um, and that, that tends to be storytelling. You, you, can, be, you can be lyrical and um, clever, and it, it doesn't work as well in front of an audience. Uh, I mean, it works very well on the page, but so, and, and I, I, I gravitate toward the, I see Mary Marsha shaking her head. I don't know, <laughs> I'd like to hear about that. Um, but anyway, I, I, I really am drawn to the narrative because it's so strong. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Can somebody hear me? Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, you inspire me. Oh, very much. Where did I go? Oh, right here. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm new here. It's my first day. Um, I'm from South Sudan. You guys can see my name over there. It's Ayak Mityang, and I'm from South Sudan. <laughs> but Welcome, Ayak. You, you inspire me with your poem. Actually, uh, when I get on the stage, I usually do only 30 seconds run because I don't know how to stand on the stage. But I've been a poet for a long time, and I write books. So I have three poetry books. I publish them. I'm my self-publisher but I just having a hard time reading them on the stage. I can do it online, but on the stage, you just, you know, I, I don't know. So now it's a good, uh, this is a good place to learn and, you know, work my way on the stage. How am I going to do it in the future? So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Glad you could join us, Ayak. All right, I think, um... If, if there aren't any more uh, people who'd like to share something, you can please uh, still do the same in the chat as, uh, as you've been doing. Uh, send all your love to Joe. And uh, Joe, you have enchanted us thoroughly tonight and I had such a great time holding this conversation with you. So thanks again. Pleasure. Thank you for being here. Uh, with that, we are going to one stop. More thing? Yes, one more yes. thing. Um, I'm going to be mostly silent in the chat. I, I don't have that multitasking ability to type um, and listen at the same <laughs> time. And I'd much rather listen and hear all the wonderful poetry. So sure, Joe. just be aware of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, we all, all know you are listening to us. So thank you for, for that. And I'll call back uh, once again uh, at the end of the open mic. But uh, with that, we are going to stop recording this segment. Uh, those of you who are in the Zoom room, please stay online for the open mic segment of the evening. Uh, to the YouTube audience, thanks for joining in and hope to see you for next month's virtual Belmont Poetry Night. Good night. <laughs>